Hello and thanks for checking in again. Let's look at the next Beethoven sonata in line, the sonata in A major, opus 2, number 2. Uh, like last time, I'm reading through the music and I'm trying to find out as much as possible about the piece before I dive into practicing. Uh, if you do like what I do, please like this video and subscribe to my channel so that I can bring you more videos and performances in the future. If we compare this first movement with the one of the first sonata, you will see that it is longer and that the exposition incorporates multiple ideas and also is developmental. The exposition is in this case expanded by introducing three ideas in the area of the first theme. The first idea is the kickoff of this sonata and it is a downwards movement in octaves and in piano in three parts. So this is this part here. It starts off with the first part, second, and third. It's a very typical for Beethoven to do something like this. The second idea is a rising scale figure in staccato eighth notes with a closing cadence written in voice levels and its repetition shows invertible counterpoint. This is what starts here and ends here. So this sounds something like this. The third idea of the first theme opens with rising 16th note triplets and here the music is set similar to two-part inventions of Johann Sebastian Bach. This part already poses a technical challenge. Beethoven frequently plays technical challenges at the beginning of his sonatas. We will see that in following sonatas as well. So this is the part that starts here. You have here the rising triplets in uh, 16th notes. And so on. Right hand, left hand, right hand again. The segments here, like I showed you, opens in A major but it modulates to the dominant E major, uh, which is the expected key of the second theme. And during the rallentando here, uh, doubt arises, and the low and sixth, the C here, already prepares the unexpected second theme key of E minor. Entering E minor, here. So we come with the C and then here we're in E minor. The second theme is marked espressivo and is developmental. It is rising through G major, B flat major, and a series of diminished seventh chords to climax in bar 76 with the return of the first idea of the first theme here at the end. So it goes through different keys. G major. B flat major and then we have the first theme And all that on a very common left hand accompaniment. But it wouldn't be uh, a Beethoven piece if it doesn't change it up uh, to make it sound more nervous and agitated by using the thirds in the left hand. So instead of the usual accompaniment, which would go like this, 
he uses the thirds. Which gives him a knocking and a driving pulse. An extension of the second theme area in the expected key of E major opens with broken octave figurations. Here. This is the next big technical challenge in this movement. The fingering for the triplet figuration is by Beethoven and was possible on Viennese pianos with the light action and shallow key dip. But most performers will find it impractical on today's instruments and instead use both hands to play the figuration. So it would sound something like this. So if you play this with one hand, this would get pretty tricky. The idea of the opening theme returns at measure 92 and is extended to close the exposition. So it returns here. Oops, where am I? Yeah. Those rising triplets and the exposition ends here with a repeat sign. The transition from exposition to development section is always a significant moment in a sonata. The young Beethoven is in this case not very talkative. He simply repeats the chords of the ending of the exposition in the minor key. So he ends it here, ending of the exposition in E major, and then repeats that in E minor. But what is very interesting is that the third E and G here is like a switch between E minor and C major. So you can hear that as with the C or you can hear that with the B as an E minor, E minor chord or C major chord. This shows the possibilities of the tonal system in which you can often hear more than is actually being played. The first part of the developmental section opens with the first theme of this sonata in C major. Here, so we got this. In C major. And moves through progressions to A flat major and F minor. So A flat major, we got here. He also incorporates the accompaniment of the second theme in this developmental section. So this, what you have here, is also the same accompaniment that we have in the second theme of the of the uh, of the exposition. He's coming to rest on this fermata here, uh, on the dominant of F minor, which is C major. And then he continues, continues this part that we already know in F major. So the second segment of the first theme serves for the remainder of the development, development section, uh, being fragmented uh, at the upbeat to bar 181, a point at which the grace notes here, all those little grace notes, uh, and melodic notes require rapid skips of the interval of a tenth, and this is a major technical challenge in this piece. At the end, the enormous energy is gradually being tamed, and the long sounding chords at the end here. And the calando that we have here again, uh, which means calando means, means gradually decreasing in speed and volume, and this will transition into the recapitulation section, which starts here again with the main theme in A major again. Uh, 
uh, in the recapitulation section, all material from the exposition is presented in order. The second theme is entering in the parallel minor key of the tonic, uh, which we have here. So it's now here in A minor. <laughs> instead of E minor uh, at first. And it's evolving to the home key A major here at the end. So here we're back in A major. The onset of the recapitulation is marked forte instead of the piano that we have at the beginning. And the first movement ends with a coda in pianissimo. So let's look at the second movement. This is the first slow movement with the expressive goal of creating a contemplating mood rather than that of presenting a beautiful flowing singing melody like we had in the second movement of the first sonata. Although this movement leads us to completely different fields of expression, it somehow relates to the ending of the first movement. You could see the repeating notes of the Largo theme as a variant of the repeating notes of the ending of the first movement. So when we begin the Largo with the right hand with those repeating notes, you could see that as a variant of the ending here. The, the texture that we have here if you look at if you look at that the texture of the main theme suggests that of a string quartet uh, with the lowermost part here being written in staccato 16th notes imitating the pizzicato of a cello and so on Beethoven often sets his, mu his piano music in a way that reminds you of different instruments or groups of instruments. In bar 19, uh, starts a passage that links to the middle part, which begins in bar 35. So this here. Here. Uh, links to the middle part which starts here we're back it, it starts with an upbeat in this linking passage here We have, uh, we have like, in a like in a string quartet, uh, the first violin that has the lead and then this the second violin or the viola taking over the lead. So it's first that the, the lead line is here in the first violin and then it moves down here to the viola, like in a string quartet. The fortissimo and subiti, subito piano in bar 31 that we have here is typical for Beethoven. He just loves those extremes. Bar 35, here starts 
the middle part with the main theme and with the lead of the lower and fuller cello sound in the left hand. So here we the, the cello here is more pronounced than it was before. With this second appearance of the main theme, we could think this is it and we could end this movement by fading out with a soft coda. And it also looks like it's starting with bar 50. Um, here. This totally sounds like the end if you listen to that. and it could end here but we have a Beethoven piece and <laughs> it doesn't end the movement here what comes next is completely unexpected sudden and seems disastrous if I play this again we have here the end the possible end so on so he this is complete sudden and unexpected and this is a second coder this this second coda enters in fortissimo in the parallel minor key of D minor and he's moving through B flat major here before he's resolving to the home key of D major again back in D major and if while listening to this sonata in a concert someone drifts off this is the part this is definitely the part where this guy will wake up uh, and as sudden and loud as this was so quick comes the movement to a quiet close here in at the end in D major Pianissimo. The third movement is a scherzo. Like in the first sonata, Beethoven added a third movement to the second sonata, the dance movement. That was until Beethoven came along only common in symphonies or string quartets. And he changed it though from a minuet with trio in the first sonata to a scherzo with trio in this sonata. And unlike the second movement, the third movement is lively and lighthearted. The fingering indicated here in the second part, here in the left hand, these finger signs here. These are by Beethoven and it's like in the first movement. Uh, it is a bit awkward uh, on, on today's pianos, so I will have to find different fingering for this part. Uh, this movement is pretty straightforward. Uh, besides the quick left hand here in the, like that I showed you here. Um, this should this needs to be very delicate and very quickly played so this is tricky but otherwise the this movement is pretty straightforward and shouldn't be that much of a 
of a, um, this shouldn't be that much of a problem to play at the end, but we'll see. Uh, the last movement is a rondo, and this is the first appearance in the piano sonatas of a rondo. Um, Beethoven's rondos often relate to the sonata form in that the first B section of the rondo is in the dominant and the second is in a tonic. Uh, this movement is so tricky to play because it has so many quick and delicate passage work, like the beginning here, and where you hear basically everything. Every mistake that you may make here is very, very uh, uh, is, is a problem because you can hear all the missing notes here these parts, all this very quick passage work. Also, all these 16th notes, they need to be played very quickly and very delicately. The tempo will be important at the end because you sometimes hear it very fast, but I have to say that I don't really like it that way. It's, it's not because it gets more difficult, of course it is more difficult to play all the passage work fast, but for me it doesn't sound graceful anymore and it says grazioso at the beginning. So if you play it too fast, it not only gets very difficult, but because of the difficulty it can easily sound sloppy and over hasty. So that's why I rather uh, take a slower tempo and see how fast I can get it without, without sounding sloppy. The main theme, interestingly, is the main theme here, this here, this part, is a direct consequence of the scherzo theme. What is separated in the scherzo is together in the rondo theme. So let me show you. In the scherzo, oh, where does this start? Here. In the scherzo, here at the beginning, we have this. And in the trio, oh sorry, not in the trio, here we have this part here in the, in the scherzo, we have this melody. So, you can see it as, and then later comes, and if you look at the, at the rondo theme, it starts off with this passage here. Um, let me see if I can get it right. So this, So you can sound, you can hear that they sound similar. So what is uh, separated in the trio is here uh, in the rondo together. Uh, the main theme is that that I just played, and then comes this sixteenth passage work here, starting off here. That goes until here, and here we have a new a new part with a nice melody. With the typical uh, accompaniment that gets tricky because we have a lot of uh, large intervals here in the left hand. So it jumps. Uh, the bass note is the interval is pretty large, so you have to jump here in the left hand with the quick uh, 16th note. So this is a, uh, a part that uh, will get pretty tri tricky, uh, especially if you play it fast. The C section begins here. And this is interesting because uh, the C section of this rondo is cast in two-part form. And the first part marked to be repeated, like you said, you see it here. Here, you have the repeat sign, and the the second part is written out in order to affect dynamic and articulation changes, as well as the transition back to the A section to the main theme. Uh, interesting is the rhythm. The rhythm here in the left hand is a typical march rhythm. We have. So this uh, rhythm is typical for a march, uh, and 
the earlier Baroque practice of aligning the 16th notes here, this is the 16th note in this march rhythm, with the triplet note above. This was done in, in earlier Baroque pieces. They aligned these notes so that it would sound like G-sharp. So you would have So this was done in, in, in Baroque time, but uh, this practice disappeared gradually in favor for separating the 16th note from the triplet. And this would sound like this. And so on. Uh, and this is, of course, diff more difficult in a fast tempo, because the left hand, this change here, needs to be quickly. And if you have it in the right hand later on here, or the jump from this part to this is in the fast tempo, this gets, this gets tricky, uh, f especially if you have to, if you play it with the left hand, which I'm doing not at the moment. So in bar 158 the coda begins and like in the second movement the A theme suddenly changes to B flat B flat major which is here. So you come from from this part and then we were in B flat. and so on. Um, and the material from the C section returns, like you heard here, and after a return to the home key of A major, yep, the A section of the rondo is restated and unwinds in a soft and playful end here. So this sonata is definitely much more difficult than the first one. The tempi in the first and last movement will make or break the performance. Uh, I do have to find a tempo that is fast enough, but that I can manage to learn in one month. I have to focus all my attention on the trickiest parts, some of them I showed you in, in this video, and learn the rest once those parts are good enough. Um, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time. Bye.